I'm going to be using the same oak that I used to make the draw boxes. There was loads of rippings from the Wayne Edge Fords, such as this one, that weren't wide enough to make a draw from. So hopefully I can use a lot of these up and make the or most of the cutlery inserts from these pieces without breaking into any of the wide boards I've got saved up there. So that's all the pieces planed down. I've run them through the belt sander and I've finished the outside pieces 15mm. So I'm going to put the same dovetail in that I put in the drawers on the outside of the cutlery inserts. Out with the lay again, same as the drawers. So easy to set up. Just a known good dovetail. Set the, the cutter height off the pins to a known good dovetail, so put it in the thing, put your router on the pin, set, the, set that height, then put it in the uh, tails mode, so you're working on your tail board, pop one of them in the jig, always put the inside face of the piece you're working on facing out towards you, and I put a pin board of the actual drawer in as well, so you've got both the pin and the tail clamped in the jig, put them up so that they sit and align to each other. Then we can set these pins up, so I'm just using a little square taper bit, so we'll get some of these out of the way. Be advised, if you're using a drill, you've got to be dead careful with it, make sure you don't strip any threads. So that wants to be like that. We're just, just going to get a couple of pins in there. So I always leave this one set roughly that far from the edge. Depends how narrow you like your edge dovetail. So mine's roughly like that. So up to you. So you set this outer pin the same based on the width of your piece. Nice and gentle with that. And then space however many bits you've got in between, however you want them. I keep the, the pointy end, so this side, tight together, not like that. That looks like a kiddies box. This looks like professional dovetails. This isn't an advert for a lady, by the way. It's just a bloody fantastic kit. So once we set that up, we're routing these bits first, so we get rid of this one because I don't want to cut into that piece. We need a sacrificial piece in the back here. We push that up so it supports the tail board. That's it, ready to go. Just after every cut, replace this sacrificial board. So for two, you, you'll do two cuts with every fresh cut at the end of a sacrificial board. You can do one like that, and then one if you just edge it along, I'll show you in a second. Just going to tighten these down as they fall out. Set me drill onto torque one. It doesn't damage them. Pop the VRS in. I've got a couple of marks here that tell me how far away from here. It's just about right. Drop the router in. The right way around. So do that for however many drawers are that height, 
so you can route them all the same, all at the same time, do all of them pieces. Once the last one of them is routed, set the batter off, remove the VRS, we want to flip this over, so we do it both sides, flip that, and set it to how much you want the pins to be routed in. So I set this, I cut my front and back of the drawer one mil wider than I want it, and then I set this half a mil deeper than the actual thickness of the sides of the drawer, and that gives me just a nice little half a mil to take off with the belt sander to get a really, really nice finish quite quickly when I'm cleaning up. Then I use one of the tail boards, sit it in, back in the jig, just at the height, just below where the cutter height is, so that the bottom of the pin board just seats up to it. And that's your reference point for the pin board. Again, face up, so this is my sanded face. The reason I said earlier about cross-cutting, so the chaff from the cross-cut here is on the underside. If any of that protruding up, when it's sat in position, it's pointing downhill, so not affecting the cut at all. If it's pointing that way up, these pins here sit on this face, and it's going to affect the cut, and also going to be seen in the final joint, whereas if it's that way around, it's on the very outside of the drawer, and it gets belt sanded off, so half of a mil gets sanded off with the end grain, with that extra half mil I take off, and then you sand this face as well, and radius, take the sharp edge off the corner, you lose all of that on the outside of the drawer, so makes sense to work from the start, knowing where each piece is going to go, because it just makes your life a lot easier. So put that piece in there, pushing up to this one. This one's not going to get cut because it's lower than the cutter height. And this is the really easy bit. You're just routing in these bits, so there's nothing too much to worry about. Put the VRS back on. So it's a different line for the VRS. It sits slightly further back to allow the guide bit or the guide bush to go between this pin and that plate. Like I say, in on the left, round and out. And it's dead easy. Once you get to this stage, you're home and dry. Flip it round to the other side, keeping the same face up. Make sure it sits against the two stops and the face of that. Pretty good to me. How quick was that? It's beautifully quick. You can't really complain at that. I mean, what a bit of kit. You just carry on, do the rest of them, and in about 15 minutes, I've made five draw boxes. I'll push them together and leave them like that for the time being. I've planed up all the pieces on the inside of here and I've sanded them down. Now I was really careful when I got the finished thickness of these because it has to match the halving joint thickness that I can make on the cross skirt. So I'll show you that now. So I'll just hold the camera so you can see a bit better. But what I've ended up doing is spacing two saw blades. So I've only got two saw blades for this saw that are the, the same size. So, a little bit dodgy, probably wouldn't recommend this at home. But on the CC you've got a massive uh, shaft there for mounting cutter blocks on. So you, I think you put like a 100mm block on this saw and use it in a cross cutting fashion. So what I've done is, I had my brother machine some spacers for me. So you could just use a normal inch and a quarter spindle spacers, you can get them in 0.1 of a mils. Well, I had a machine one to sort of roughly the right size of the piece, the inner pieces that I wanted, which was 13 mil. 
and I've put that between the two saw blades so when they're stacked together with that spacer there's a 13 mil from outer cut to outer cut so what that's going to give me is a, a perfect groove width that's not going to alter so it's called a dado cutter but uh, a dado cutter will actually cut out all the material in the middle this is a little bit dangerous in that it leaves a strip in the middle that's uncut so i wouldn't recommend doing it like this at home but you need a, a method really of cutting a halving joint where the two cuts are perfectly parallel to each other and once you've got that method then you can thickness your timber to suit the right size to that cut Sanded that in to a lovely fit. It's nice and tight. So I've just just pushed that in by hand. By the time I've sanded both faces with the orbital sander at 180 grit, that should be the perfect fit. Now I've got all the internal strips, thickness to size, sanded, uh, ready to go. I just need a final sand when I finish working them. I'm just going to find the pieces that I need to cut any of the cross joints, so the halving joints. So any point at these spice racks where there's two pieces cross like this, that's what I'm gonna focus on first. So these are the two that are 70 mm of this thickness, and then there's some other frames that are slightly different thicknesses, but I'll just focus on one of these. So we'll work on this one here. So the cross joint here is right in the middle. So I'm just gonna find these pieces of wood that are designated for these parts, so one around 430 and one around 520, which are these two here. And I've marked a top mark on there as well. So this is gonna be my top face of the one that crosses the piece of the drawer insert. So this is this piece here. And then this piece is the one that goes front to back. So for the cross piece, I like to do the joints so that they match the rest of the drawer. So this part here will go full thickness through the drawer and the joints that you see on the top will be this bit and this bit be the shorter joints and then the, the joint line runs through in this direction here. So in order to do that, the front to back piece needs to be housed on the bottom side and the piece that goes across the drawer needs to be housed out the top. So I don't worry about cutting it to length just yet. All I'm gonna do is mark 253 in from both ends of this piece of timber. I'll do 255, give me a, just a rough idea. The center, and they're fairly far apart here, they're marked. And I'm just gonna put a housing joint somewhere in the middle. As long as it is at least the width I need either side away from the ends of the timber, that's absolutely fine. So I'm going to cut that joint now at the top so that the front to back piece runs through. Same process with the other part. So I want the housing joint out the bottom and then I've got 115 mil gap this end to the end cut here and then 306 front to back. So as long as I've got that left to be able to cut that later on, that's absolutely fine. So 115. 6. So I can cut them too on the housing joint on the saw now. In order to set this blade right in the middle, I know I've got a good amount of timber left on the ends of these before I cut them to final length. So I just set the saw and cut sort of half, half a saw blade's width off the end of material of two pieces and then push them together and at the point at which they touch as they push together is the perfect height setting for the housing joint.
Holding multiple bits together and cutting them all at once helps prevent any breakout on the back edge of all the pieces so you get a much finer finish from the saw. Now I actually have a joint that pushes together. Very tightly because it's not been sanded yet. Make sure we're pushing underneath the joint, not at the ends of the piece of wood. Actually you're going to be pinching it together as you try and push it together. So you almost want to sp spread it open as you push it together, rather than make it self-pinching. So we go, got oh, a lovely, lovely housing joint there which we knew was going to be a perfect fit because we kind of made it backwards. We did the joint and then made the timber thickness to suit. So you'd really struggle to tell how that was put together because of how tight that halving joint is. Get right in there. You can just, just, just see where there's the sort of cross point where there's no timber in the middle. But by the time there's a, a finish on there, you won't see that. So, really, really nice. While we're at this point now, you know we've got a good joint, we can get it in the right place. So, we're working off this drawing again. I'm just going to measure 115 from this point here to there. Cut that one off. And then, I'm going to use from that cut, I'm going to work from my actual drawer. I'm going to put the cut face in on this side and then mark the opposite side of the drawer and cut that in so it fits perfectly tight in there. Just got to get it apart first. Like I said, halving joints, really, really easy to knacker these up by trying to bash them to bits. If you're on a bench, it's not level or hit one side of the joint. But if you just manipulate the timber so you sort of splay the joint open that way and that way, should come together, it's come apart really nice and easily without damaging it. So let's mark my 115 with my special tape. So I'm going to have to zoom in just how accurate this tape is. So I bloody love it. Look, I want 115, so. Oh, look at that, how flat it lays on that piece of wood. I can mark so accurately on that 100mm. Obviously, I'll put the link in the description for the tape measure. Beautiful. Look at that, holds itself in. Gotta be accurate with these cuts, it just makes all the difference. So that's the front to back cut done. I can do the same with this one, so 253 from both sides. I can mark both sides and just cut that from the tick mark. You want to see that tape measure again, don't you? Let's go for a different angle this time. Oh! Can you see how flat it is onto that piece of wood? That should go together. That should sit in like so. Hopefully, you start to see resemblance of what we're working to. So, now I need to cut a piece here to go full length, and then two pieces to match this length here.
I can use all these pieces now to mark where I'm going to drill to screw and plug the fixings for all of these points where it's a butt joint into a cross piece. So I'm just going to screw through from the outside into that piece and then use a plug cutter bit to plug the hole where the screw goes. So I need to disassemble this. This is where you need to have marked all your orientation of your outside pieces so it all makes sense when you come to put it back together. This is the front to back piece. If I take that to the side of my drawer, I know I've got a joint in this right hand side. So I can mark the position of the joint and the centre line. Square that across and around my timber. Do that for all the points where you need a, a screw or plug on all them intersections. And we're going to put just two screws so evenly spaced across the piece of timber. Got a 70 mil piece. I'm going to go about 18. I think about 18 in from the edge. Just just what looks right really. That looks about right to me by the time you've got two half inch plugs in there. I want to be fairly close to this edge so it pulls the shoulders nice and tight. And I'm just going to set the fence to that depth. But what I'm going to use is a plug cutting bit. So I've got these bits from Trend. So I'm going to use the number 10 cutter here which is a number 10 plug cutter. And it does a does the pilot hole and the plug cut bit all in one pass. So it saves you no end of time drilling the plug hole and then drilling the pilot hole or the clearance hole afterwards. It does it all in one pass. You do need to have a fairly quick or high speed drill so that you get a smooth cut. Otherwise the edges on here can be quite jagged and, and tear the timber. I'm just going to set the, the cut depth. So it does about 5mm shoulder to the plug and then leaves enough material in the hole for the screw to bite onto. And then just cut it to our lines. What's good about these is the bottom profile of the cut actually perfectly matches the pellets, which we'll make in a minute. So if I just drill a test one here. And then tap in one of the pellets that the plug cutter makes. So even though I've only used the shallowest bit of the pellet, the pocket hole and the pellet match perfectly. So you just get that little bit of allowance for a screw head. And then the, you get like a, a really good glue joint. Whereas if you just use a square cut cutter, you get quite a lot of timber removal, which isn't actually filled with glue. So that's a, the good thing about using that cutter is it matches perfectly. Like I say, there is a bit of a knack to using these. You are, if you want a really, really clean hole, you're gonna have to use a bit that's got like a lip or a spur cutter to really cut the outside of the hole. These will tear the grain if you don't use them absolutely correctly. Just trying out the carbide insert cutter. So I'll put a link to this one in the description, but Trend have sent this over with a few other bits for me to try. And it's tenfold better than the, the normal one. Did a really really neat hole. And obviously being carbide it's going to stay sharp for a very long time.
Now that they're all cut, and I've marked the positions, not on this one, but on the other one, I'm going to glue them together periodically based on which bit I need to sand. So after I've glued a, a plug joint together, I put the plugs in, and you need to sand that joint off before you assemble the next bit so it's nice and easy. So looking at this type of assembly here, I obviously need to put the plugs in on this one here and sand them flush there and the plugs in on this one here and sand that flush before I do the plugs on this one here. So if I was to plug screw and then sand that one first, I'd then have to try and do this one afterwards with this piece in the way. So I've got to work methodically through each cutlery insert so that I get them all right. So once I've got them, all the T-junctions on the internal side plugged and sanded, I can then assemble the halving joints and screw that into the frame. So before we do any of that, I'm going to glue the outer dovetail frame together. Just a note while I've got the saw set up, you can make a massive difference to the quality of the finish by how you use a, a crosscut saw. So a lot of people use a zero clearance insert to get a nice cut on the back, but they're only great for a few cuts and then you start to get a bit of rounding on the insert and then you start getting breakout. So what I tend to do with a sliding miter saw like this, instead of just blasting through from the front, so starting at the front and working my way back or blasting through for a start and then pulling it forward, I tend to run a score cut along the top of the the piece of timber so that, that cuts in a couple of mil with the blade direction running into the wood so you don't get any break out there and then when you get to the front of the piece of wood have the blade extended beyond so the back of the teeth are then digging into the wood and throughout this bottom corner here the teeth are actually going in at an angle so it's biting into the wood so there's no chance of the grain on the outside breaking out because you're cutting inwards and then once you got to that point then travel back along the piece and if your saw's set up pretty nice and true and it's a good quality saw then you should have a nice true cut all the way through. If you're getting break out on one side of the blade on your return cut it means your saw's not set up quite accurately and you need to adjust the way the head is sat on the rails or how the, the fence is sat against the head. Well, I'll show you what I mean, the difference between the two. So you might just plunge through like that. You need a really nice blade in this, but you can see you get quite a, a raised edge on this, this edge here. Or you can cut it so you, like I'm saying, difference between the two but because uh, the blade is really really fine on this saw but the one on the right there you've got a bit of a raised cut from where the the grain exits and you can see the, the bits of break out there hopefully you can anyway whereas the one here absolutely perfect because you've cut into the piece of wood all the way around on both sides the only breakout you've got is at the back right gluing up a dovetail much the same as I did in the drawers video. PU glue, only apply glue to the draw sides, or the, the sides of the dovetail joint, which is the uh, tails, isn't it? These are the tails. I just take them up like so. This is a really clean, really quick, and really strong way to glue up dovetails. PU glue, this is worth loads of different brands. It's not going to make any difference which brand you use for drawers because there's no time constraint because they're really quick to glue up. My favourite brand of PU is the Woodweld PU adhesive. The Woodweld. We just want a nice little dub, about the size of a garden pea, not a petit point. It's got a little brush here. Keep it in some thinners between drawers so it doesn't dry out after the first drawer. Just any, any old thinners will get rid of the PU glue, stop it from setting. And just spread that glue all over 
the ends of the draw sides. I'm working in a downhill. I don't bring any strokes of glue uphill because that's likely to lift the tape and put some glue on the parts that are seen. So all my glue strokes are downhill away from that sort of shoulder line and cover absolutely everything. Make sure you get plenty on the end grain to hit at the two sides, at the top and the bottom of the drawer. To do that for all four, you know, with the tape there you can be dead messy, not got to worry too much. Remove the tape as soon as you've applied it. Do the other end. The other good thing about this is you don't need loads and loads of clamps. If you're leaving clamps on your drawers when you're gluing up to get the joints nice and tight on these shoulders, you only need two sets of clamps because after about 10 minutes you can take your first set of clamps off because the glue's dry. So no glue squeeze yet on these shoulders. And if we put it together right, you shouldn't get any at all. Lay that on the bench. And the PU glue, it's enough to just glue one side of the joint. So I don't need to put any glue on this piece. And you still get a real good bond on this surface against that shoulder. Because the glue sort of soaks into the end grain and then expands. So what, if you, even if you slide what's on the surface off as you assemble the joint, it then expands a little bit and still glues onto this surface. Whereas if you use a runny glue like cascomite or PVA or tight bond, what glue you get on the shoulder of the joint when you assemble it and push it off, all it, all it ends up doing is it just soaks into the end grain just a little bit more after that point. And the bond between this surface and that surface is really crap. And you end up with barely any glue on that shoulder and a, a cracked joint after a, you know, the first little bit of movement that that sees. The joint's cracked. So push them together. And as you see, no glue squeeze yet. What I tend to do is clamp both sides of the joint in this direction so it seats properly up to the inside of the dovetail housing. Then release that clamp pressure evenly so the joint doesn't distort as you release the pressure. And then I turn the clamps the other way. So I turn it that way so they get a nice clamp pressure through the joint in this direction. And then that way you're guaranteed to have lovely tight shoulders on your draw box or whatever dovetail joint it is you're gluing up. Like I say, you don't need millions of clamps to clamp them like this because the glue will be dry in about 10 minutes. And before I put that final clamp on the top, on the other side, I'm just checking the frame four square with the outer corners. So you poke one end of the square stick into the corner and tick the opposite corner and then if you check both corners they should be exactly the same. Right so the last couple are just drying off in the clamps but uh, just to show you the minimal glue squeeze and clean up. Not wiped the inside of the joints here with anything. And you can see they are perfectly clean. So there's no work whatsoever in cleaning them joints up. But well, we've got a nice little bit of glue squeeze out the top and that is properly bonded. So if you try and take one of these joints to bits, there is a decent adhesion between this piece on the top here on the shoulder and the other bit so it's, it's really is the best glue for gluing up dovetail joints. I'm just using an F clamp to clamp a, a separate piece of the cutlery insert that's got a square end on the side of the joint that I need so that when I screw it I can just hold this piece nice against that square edge and then pilot drill it knowing that I'm getting a square joint at the end of it.
Again, the littlest stub of glue just in the centre so it locks the joint it doesn't squeeze out. Put that in place. And a couple of three and a half by thirty mil screws. Then I can nip over to the vise. Again, get a bit of glue around the outside edge of the pellet hole. Tap a couple of pellets in. Making sure that the grain is the same direction. Now it's really tricky to tell from the top, because as I'll show you in a minute when I make these, that the, the bandsaw lines leave like a perpendicular line to the actual grain direction. So I tend to look underneath the pellet find out your grain direction and then turn it over making sure that it's nice and in line. In order to clean these off you can attack them with a chisel and just pare your way down to the bottom of the plug but you end up putting quite a lot of pressure on the plug and more often than not as you get down if you, if you start chiseling there the grain will dive into the plug and go below the surface of this so it's quite a long-winded way you tend to want to work across grain and in little bites so you work your way down to the bottom of the plug and you can see already the grains are on the way so you'd have to switch and then pare it down in this manner like this and just be careful of that back edge as you get nearer to the base of the plug go more with the grain and we're about there and then that's ready for sanding but I've done thousands of these in, in many many frame legend and brace doors attaching hundreds of boards on and the quickest way by far is just to set your hand planer onto zero or just beyond zero if it'll go I mean this one doesn't really go to zero it's always taking like 0.1 of a mil off even on zero but set it to that and then just gently drop it in while it's running and just plane it down flush with the top. So once you're there, you can just belt sand that off. Once the initial joints are done, I can do any connecting ones, drill, screw and plug them as before. Ooh la la. I'm oh, pretty pleased with that. Okay, I'll show you how I do the plugs now, or make the plugs. These cutters are worth their weight in gold, so I'll put a link in the description. But they produce a perfectly tapered plug with a little rounded end that makes it really easy to get into the plug hole once it's been drilled. A lot of the plug cutters just produce a perfectly straight plug and you find them really difficult to get them to tap into the hole without damaging the outer edge of the hole. So this, like I say, worth the weight in gold and by the time you've bought a pack of 100 plugs you can pretty much buy the cutter and make the plugs you need out of it. It'll last a lot longer than 100 plugs. So good value in my opinion. I'll put a link to these, this set and the, the part numbers in the description. So just 
take the counterpart bit out of the chuck. I'm just going to set the depth. I want the depth of the piece of wood to just, just hit the curve of the cutter. So I'll wind that bed up until I start to get a curve on the plug, which is about there. And I drill them all that depth. It's about perfect. Set the fence up so it's just off the edge of the timber to the cut. Start drilling. I'm going to turn the speed down a little bit. Ideally you want to be as slow as possible so it doesn't burn, but the slower you go, the more likely you are to snap the plug in the cutter. Just, just developing a bit of a a turn on the ed outer edge of that cut, which is perfect. I don't want too much of a round. That's perfect. So you just got enough to slot it into your plug hole and then tap it home nicely, so the taper creates a nice tight joint. When I'm using this in a drill, just a nice smooth action. I'm not jolting the timber at all. What I don't want to do is snap these plugs in the bit because then you have to tap them out and you, you run the risk of bending these cutter pieces and then you've ruined the cutter. Them, but what is there? It's probably 60 pellets there, done in a, a matter of minutes out of the timber that I need. And then to harvest these little rippers, just come over to the bandsaw. It's the safest way to do it. And just set the fence to the bottom of the pellet, turn it on, and then they'll just vibrate out and fall on the bed. Beautiful little pellets. And if you look at the cross section, it's got a very slight taper from the top of the pellet there at the narrowest to the bottom, which is the widest. So yeah, pretty impressed with the, the pellet cutter. Should just slot in quite nicely, look at that. Just the tiniest smear of glue on the end grain. There we go. Look at that. Dead easy. Worked out well, that. Now it's all glued up, just fill the outside holes with the pellets. It's a nice little trick to get them back out if you do. It's just drive a screw unpiloted straight through the middle of the plug. And when the tip of the screw hits the uh, wood screw that's in behind the plug, it obviously doesn't uh, go in any further. It spins and then extracts the plug off the head of the wood screw.
Okay, so this is the point at which having a wide belt sander becomes very beneficial. So I'm just going to level these out by pushing them under the sander. It's just going to take off all the imperfections on all of these joints. So I'm going to push them through in this direction on the diagonal and there's less stress on the edges than if you put them through at 90 degrees. Right, so there we go. That is the cutlery insert done. Now, I'm not going to show you the process of lacquering these. So it's just a pretty simple process of uh, a light base stain and then two coats of lacquer. I showed it in the drawer videos, it's, it's pretty boring. So um, I'm just going to leave this video here. It's more about the making of these. But to uh, just show you what the sort of aim was, was to have them interchangeable. So these hob drawers, there's actually nine drawers along the hob run that are all the same size. So six of these inserts are for that hob run. These ones with the little squares are to fit mugs in. So when you've got your, your fancy mugs or beakers, they'll sit upside down, but I don't want to put a tea stain in this, but uh, you can sit them individually in each square and they all got their own slot and don't move around when you open the drawer. But uh, the idea of having the open bottom to these is so that the customer can cut their own liners for the drawer. They can use this frame as a guide to cut the liner around the outside and then you don't need to be that accurate with the cut because the outside of this frame will actually hide your cut. So drop your liner in then drop the frame down on top. You can have a nice soft liner with this sat on top and it looks really, really smart. I'll just show you some of the other units in this one drawer. So this one's for bigger sort of cooking utensils. You've got a bit more height on this one. This one's actually 95 mil tall. So they're quite big inserts. So there's two of these the same. And there's two of these which are full mug ones as well, so two full mugs, one that's got half mugs and the other half dividers. The other inserts are for various top drawers around the kitchen. So I'll just take the camera around for a couple of extra shots. So the trend plugs work really well. I'm, I'm dead impressed with the actual plug cutter. The, the drill bit with the plug hole bit sort of countersink bit attached to it is great but uh, if you want a really really sharp hole you're gonna have to use that 
carbide tipped one or use a bit with a lip and a spare so that you get a really really sharp edge on the pocket hole but uh, I think they look pretty good I mean if you look at the the ones here these are done with the carbide cutter and they're pretty good for a plug or a pellet I think the most of the line that you see there is caused by the fact I've used PU glue you get a little bit of a a glue line with that so you get quite a, an almost slightly sharper line if you used a runny glue like a tight bond but I'm pretty impressed with that as a finish so it should look good once I've uh, got a coat of lacquer on there and denibbed them and I'll, I'll spend about a day sanding and lacquering these There we go, all denibbed, ready for the next coat. So all ten little frames. As always, if you haven't already clicked subscribe, it really helps the video do well on YouTube if you hit the thumbs up and leave a comment. So if you've got any questions at all, then drop us a comment and I'll definitely get back to you and do the best I can to answer you.